Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Davashi, one of the mentors at Study Medic and this is an uh, eight another initiative from our side as a triple R series for the study A4G and the topic would be on reproductive medicine. So, uh, when I was, this is a very, uh, very nice quote by, Dr. by uh, Henry Ford where he says, when everything seems to be going against you, remember an aeroplane takes off against the wind, not with it. So for every uh, success, or for everything we need to go up, we, we definitely would have resistance. And it is always a, the power that we gain to overcome it. So that makes us successful. And this um, topic, the, the topic for uh, today, as I said, would be reproductive medicine. and the things that we would cover in it would be the assisted conception techniques and the ovulation stimulation protocols. And this is based on the ASHRAE guideline. Okay. So let's uh, start off and yes. What is meant by assisted reproductive techniques? Assisted reproductive technology is all the treatments and techniques that involve the in vitro, that is outside handling of human gametes or the embryos with an intention to achieve a pregnancy. Remember, assisted insemination procedure, that is either a partner's or the donor, is not included in the assisted reproductive technology, as per the ashray. So uh, this assisted reproductive technology includes multiple different parts of which uh, the pre-stimulation management is important, followed by there is a stimulation of the ovaries, followed by the oocytopic and an embryo transfer, which would be uh, followed with the luteal phase support, support. So these are the things which would be covered in this, and the stimulation protocols would be also be covered in this. So pre-stimulation management is basically to assess the response of the ovaries to the stimulation. Okay, how are we going to see? So this is nothing but the prediction. How do we predict whether the ovarian response will be good or bad depends upon the um, uh, the antifollicle follicle count or the anti-mullerian hormone, AMH. Okay, these are the two recommended things that would tell us what would be the response uh, to the stimulation. They have got a higher accuracy and the other ovarian tests, which includes the FSH, inhibin and AH, they have some predictive value, but they do not have a great prediction, okay? And remember, the basal E2 or the BMI alone cannot be used as predictors and so not used for prediction of ovarian response accurately. So the best possible way to uh, uh, to predict ovarian response is the antifollicle count of the AMH. So how do we uh, uh, say that? It is basically, it is basically the uh, um, antral follicle count or the AMH, not FSH, okay? FSH uh, is not an accurate predictor. So with AMH and EFC, how do we predict the response? If the antral follicle count is less than or equal to four, then it is a low response. And when there is a high response that is more than or equal to 16, we call it as a high response. When it corresponds to AMH, women with less than or equal to 5.4 picomoles per liter would be considered to have a low response. And women who have more than or equal to 25 picomoles per liter would be expected to have a high response. Remember, we get two values. Either it can be in the nanogram per ml or it can be the picomole. If we get it in the picomole, uh, picomole is a uh, standard, but then to get it into nanomole, it has to melt it to be multiplied by 0.14, okay? So this is, so when anything between less than or equal to four is a low response and more than 16, equal to or more than 16 is considered to be a uh, high response in, in reference to that of the antral follicle count. So with that, we would be able to predict whether the woman is a high responder or a normal responder or a OVN or a poor responder, okay? So we have e stimulation protocols for each of those uh, responders. But before we go into that within stimulation protocols, we would look into what are all the uh, when to use what? Before that, we would look into the ovarian stimulation protocols, the different types, the types of gonadotrophins, and what what is that we um, get? What is that we have to do with the LH suppression regimens? Okay. 
the mechanism of action of the normally inner uh, stimulation protocol. Okay, we give the ovaries uh, the the woman gonadotrophins to stimulate the ovaries, and this stimulation will cause an raised estrogen levels, which will stimulate the LH. Okay, will which which will cause the LH surge. Okay, so the basic idea of um, the uh, stimulation protocol is that we will have to give them gonadotrophins, which should not cause an LH suppression, or we should not let the LH suppression, LH surge go up. So we will have to suppress the LH, and once the follicles are mature, then we give that trigger to cause the uh, um, maturation of the oocyte. So when there is a stimulation, the E2 becomes a super, goes to the supraphysiological levels, which would definitely stimulate an LH surge. Okay, so the basic idea is to suppress the LH, okay, and for which we use agonist or the antagonist. Agonist, what is the agonist? The mode of action is that it initially, in the initial phase, what it causes is it goes and attaches to the um, receptors, okay, the um, GNR receptors, which causes increased LH under FSH, which would be, there would be an initial flare when we give an agonist. But then when we give it for a prolonged periods of time, okay, what happens is there is a, uh, the receptors are uh, down-regulated that there is a loss of receptors. And so there will not be any stimulation at all. So this causes uh, the LH, uh, the gonadotrophin releasing hormone um, is uh, totally uh, down-regulated. So we don't produce LH or the FSH. So this is the basic idea when we use gonadotropins against the when we give it for a prolonged periods, it causes the suppression of the LH such. Okay. So initially there may be a, a, a stimulation or a flare of endogenous, but later on there is an uh, due to sustained uh, sustained levels, there is a depletion of the receptors which causes uh, suppression of the LH such. Okay. What happens in case of antagonist? Okay, when we give antagonist, it definitely it goes and binds to the GnRH receptors and causes um, the it, it directly inhibits and thereby it prevents the LH. Cell. So when it goes and binds to the LH uh, to the GnRH receptors, they automatically block the uh, release of the LH cell. So either when gonadotrophins are given, it causes an immediate suppression, whereas gonadotrophin agonist causes this, when it is given on a long term basis, it causes a suppression of the LH such. Okay, so this is the basic idea. So, what are all the different agonists and antagonists? Antagonists are basically Ganarelix, Ceterolix, Degarelix, or Aberelix, but the commonly used is a Ganarelix and Ceterolix. And when it comes to GNRH against, okay, when it is given for a long time, for example, Luprolite, okay, Gozerolin, Tuptorolin, Buzerolin. And all these things, when it is given on a long-term basis, they cause suppression, okay? So these are all the agonist and antagonists that are available in the market, which is used for the prevention of the LH search, okay? So basically, uh, the gonadotrophin stimulate ovarians, ovaries to produce more of follicles, but this again causes an LH surge, which will be suppressed by the uh, antagonist or the agonist, okay? In a GNRH long protocol, what happens is, as I said, when we give gonadotropin agonist for a long time, this causes a suppression, endogenous suppression of gonadotropins. And when we, um, when there would be a total lack of endogenous LH. So when we give gonadotropins from outside, it causes stimulation and the LH uh, suppression LH will still be suppressed, and once the follicles are mature, the trigger can be given, then followed by an ovum pickup and a luteal phase support. See, whatever I have marked, the GNRH agonist long protocol is a commonly is one of the commonly used protocols. There are other protocols like short protocol where the suppression is only for the short time. Okay. And these two do not suppress the LH uh, in a good way. And in that case, what we do is uh, the other protocols can be used, which is a GNRH antagonist protocol, which can be a fixed protocol or a flexible protocol. Fixed protocol is starting it on day six, okay? Whereas flexible, day six of the stimulation, okay? Whereas flexible protocol is we wait until the follicle becomes 13 mm or 14 mm and then start because at the at the 14 more than 14 millimeter there there would be an LH 
as such okay to prevent that we give antagonist at uh, when the follicle is putting so and we wait it can be day 14 or day uh, uh, sorry day uh, five day six or day seven depending upon the follicle size okay whereas with set protocol is whether irrespective of whether the size has been achieved or not we start antagonist on day six so the common protocols that we use is the long protocol uh, the agonist long protocol or the antagonist which is a fixed or the flexible protocol okay there are other uh, protocols please do not worry about it but just to know the important protocols that is used is the gnrh long protocol and the antagonist fixed protocol okay so in this as i said the gnrh agonist is given from day 21 of the previous cycle which causes a suppression long term suppression of an endogenous um, uh, FSH and LH. So when we give it for a long time, okay, there is no endogenous uh, FSH and LH. And from day two, or um, uh, when she on when we start stimulation with gonadotrophins, usually on the day two, the gonadotrophins cause the ovarian stimulation, but LH is suppressed because of this agony. So every day, uh, um, the GnRH agonist injections has to be given from the twenty first day of previous cycle till the day of the trigger okay this would prevent the um, lh suppression so the this gnrh analog will prevent lh search okay prevent lh search and like likewise what happens in the antagonist protocol we start giving window drop in and by the day six or when the follicle is 14 mm there might be an LH surge which can be prevented by adding the GnRH antagonist this again causes the same uh, prevents the LH surge okay once the follicle is mature enough around 18 mm 18 to 20 uh, 18 mm then we give a trigger which is prefer which is usually a hcg but i would talk to you about the uh, trigger what are all those triggers that can be given okay so they, these are the important protocols that we should know and there are other protocols which which is nothing but a mild stimulation where we use initially clomiphene or letrozole okay this is done usually for a poor responders okay uh, mild stimulation uh, where uh, the clomiphene or the letrozole is given for 5 days then followed by which we can start off antagonist to prevent the LH surge and at the same time we can give a uh, recombinant FSH or a HMG to cause uh, the ovarian stimulation to for the stimulation to go on and trigger would be given for the final maturation. So when it comes to when to use which protocol, that is something very, very, very important. Okay, we should know when should we use a proper protocol. So it is an individualization of protocol and basically for women who are high responders okay so if the woman becomes a high is a high responder the the preferred uh, or the recommended protocol so who are all those who have high response either women with pcos or women with high amh or women um uh, early young women all these women are uh, um, are at risk of developing a um uh, ohss or they might be called as a high responders so in such cases a gonadotropin antagonist protocol would be the preferred method because women with high responders are at increased risk of OHSS and to reduce the risk of OHSS, antagonist protocol is to be followed. If agonist protocols are, if we don't have an option, we are starting with an agonist protocol, then a reduced dose of gonadotropin is probably recommended to reduce the risk of OHSS. So what happens in a normal responder? Normal responders are not much of a problem. They are expected to respond properly. And in such cases, a GNRH antagonist protocol would be the recommended protocol. And again, uh, we are looking at an OHSS free, cl free clinic wherein we do not want women to undergo OHSS. Okay, So that is the reason why GNRH antagonist protocol is recommended when compared to that of a, uh, um, agonist protocol. Okay. So what happens in case of a poor responders? Poor responders are those women who are expected to respond to a stimulation protocol in a uh, lower way. So for such women, either an antagonist protocol or an aggressive protocol, both can be given. They are equally risk recommended. And uh, these women are not at increased risk of OHSS. So we are not worried about it. So both uh, protocols can be used. 
Whereas um, in such poor responders, there is something called a mild stimulation. As I said, we can either use a clomiphene or clomiphene in combination with uh, clomiphene or letrozole in combination uh, with gonadotrophins. But generally, letrozole to gonadotrophin is not recommended. Okay, and um, gonadotropin alone uh, is uh, uh, is can be used as a mild stimulation where they can use a minimal dose. All these things can are equally recommended, except that letrozole can need not be uh, letrozole with gonadotropin is not recommended. Okay, in poor responders, so should we use a high dose of gonadotropins for them to be uh, stimulated? It is very unclear whether gonadotropins beyond the dose of 150, that is FSH beyond 150 is um, uh, whether if we use a higher dose, uh, will, it, will it cause a good effect for poor responders? It is very unclear, but generally doses beyond 300 for a poor responder is not recommended based on the ESHA guideline. Am I clear so far? So I hope it has been clear so far, and then I'm moving on to the different types of uh, gonadotropins. So when it comes to gonadotropins, okay, we, we have seen a lot of, we might have come across a lot of gonadotropins. You know, we might be confused what is a HMG, what is a um, purified HMG, what is a highly purified HMG, and what is a recombinant HMG, a recombinant FSH. See, recombinant FSH is basically a genetically engineered uh, molecule which has a batch to batch consistency. Okay, whereas HMG is a uh, human menopausal gonadotrophin which are basically retrieved from the urinary, urine of a menopausal woman. Okay, so it might have, uh, this might have activities of FSH, LH, and that can be proteins. So that is the reason why usually HMG is given intramuscular and FSH precombinants can be given in a subcutaneous manner. So ESHA guideline says both of them are equally recommended. We can use either a genetically engineered uh, recombinant FSH or a HMG, but generally HMG has got a, uh, does not have a batch to batch consistency. So if at all we are using one batch, it has to be the same batch which we should be using throughout the cycle. Okay. Hope it is clear so far. And this is for the agonist, um, uh, antagonist protocols. When it comes to agonist, again, anything can be used, okay? Uh, it, it is either a recombinant or a highly purified. Highly purified has less of uh, uh, LH activity. Purified uh, has, um, uh, sorry, that is highly purified HMG. Um, or a purified HMG has an or um, uh, has a, a little bit activity of LH. Okay, HMG has equal activities of FSH and LH. Okay, so in case of uh, agonist cycles, there is no one gonadotrophin that is preferred, but generally all can be uh, all things are equally recommended. Okay, and remember when we are using an recombinant FSH, there are also recombinant LH that is available. But uh, when we use instead of HMG, can we use an uh, recombinant? Recombinant FSH and recombinant LH, generally recombinant uh, LH, okay, it increases the risk of OHSS. When we use combine it together, it increases the risk of OHS and it is gen uh, it's not recommended for the stimulation. Only RFSH or uh, HMG can be used. They are equally recommended. So we have started stimulating the woman, but then we are so scared of the uh, LH surge because when we start stimulating, the gonadotrophin start secreting estrogens, which can cause an um, feedback to the uh, pituitary, uh, hypothalamic pituitary axis, which will stimulate the ELH such. Okay. So even at the generally our body is tuned to um, uh, uh, usually the ELH such occurs if the um, estrogen level go beyond the level of 500. So generally um, uh, on day five or day six, the uh, uh, antagonist is given if the gonadotrophins are alone started, then from day in the antagonist cycle, it is started on day five to day six. That is antagonist, usually uh, for LH suppression, GNRH antagonist is a preferred protocol. It is started from day five and day six, which causes the separation of the LH. Whereas in case of agonist protocol, where there will be an initial flare, so in such cases, we have to start it from the previous day 21 of the previous cycle and then continue, which causes LH suppression. 
okay so in case of uh, uh, gnrh agonist protocol it has to be a long protocol which is re probably recommended over a short or the ultra short uh, agonist protocol because they do not cause that much of lh suppression when compared to that of a, a long uh, agonist protocol okay yes so uh, we this is the stimulation protocols or uh, agonist and antagonist where which should be used but then when we start the stimulation what should we do when we start the stimulation generally monitoring uh, of the ovarian response is very very important and for which an ultrasound is a preferred a transvaginal ultrasound is a preferred method to monitor the cycles uh, can we uh, what are the other monitoring ways by which we can do is monitoring ultrasound uh, uh, so ultra uh, by ultrasound or with a biochemical values uh, with estrogen level so when there are a lot of gonadotrophins lot of follicles will develop which will produce estrogen so should we monitor e2 levels the ESHRAE guideline says ultrasound monitoring along with e2 values is not recommended but the preferred would be ultrasound okay ultrasound monitoring along with e2 progesterone and lh measurements is definitely not recommended and along with the ovarian response the endometrial response which which should be in synchrony with um, uh, both should be there but since there is a supraphysiological levels the estrogen that is being secreted may cause um, the that is the the stimulation and the endometrium the ovarian response and the endometrial response may not be in a synchronous way and so generally a routine monitoring of the endometrial thickness during the stimulation is probably not recommended and on the day of the trigger or the ovum pickup usually the endometrial thickness can be measured which helps us in counseling the women to know about their chance of pregnancy basically if the endometrium is less than 7 mm the chances of having a uh, pregnancy might reduce and um, so the endometrial thickness on the day of the trigger or ovum pickup needs to be done. So we 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 look at the scans and um, the LH suppression is suppressed by the agonist or the antagonist. And when do we cause a final maturation? That is when do we trigger? Okay. So the follicle uh, for it to have a final oocyte maturation, the trigger is given based on case to case basis. When the leading follicle, there might be a lot of follicles, but then the leading follicle, if it is between 16 to 22 mm, then we need to give a trigger, but the trigger should not be based on the E2 levels. And also, in case of GNRH agonist cycles, where the, there is a prolonged suppression, and when there, these are the women who would be a, either a... Um, uh, uh, normal uh, responder or a uh, poor responder or even um, uh, low responders poor responders may have less of follicles but women who have uh, who are who are either a uh, high responder or normal responder you know especially high responder if the follicles are more than 18 they are at an increased risk of OHSS and in such cases if it is an agonist cycle then remember the culprit for OHSS is always HCG okay so preventive measures have to be recommended that is what are all those preventive measures either posting or giving uh, cancelling the cycle or um, uh, pick up and then freeze all okay these might be an um, uh, might uh, might reduce the risk of OHSS, but remember the HCG is always a trigger. Even if with uh, pickup is done, and then if we do freeze all also, there is a chance that the women might have a chance of having an OHSS. So basically, the trigger is for final maturation. And what do we do for the final maturation? For the final maturation, we need the LH surge. Okay, LH surge. The hormone mimicking um, uh, the mid-cycle LH surge is basically the thing which causes a final maturation. So how do we give basically the LH activity uh, is um, whatever we give has a short half-life. And so uh, it's always um, uh, HCG, which is given as a oocyte with final uh, trigger. Okay, maturation trigger. HCG is given because it is a surrogate. It has an LH activity and it has got a half-life. So it is similar to that of the, which causes a surrogate to the mid 
cycle and its surge, and that is the reason why we use HCG as a trigger. Okay, the structural and biological similarities they bind because of that they bind to the LH receptors and they cause an LH surge. And HCG has a long half life and also they cause release of vasoactive substances, and that is the reason why HCG is a culprit for OHSS to reduce. The risk of OHSS, what we can do is we can avoid giving HCG and we can give an agonist trigger. What does an agonist do? It again has a mimic FSH and LH. So when we give an agonist trigger, especially for the antagonist, if uh, if it is an antagonist cycle, then we give an agonist trigger. Okay. What happens? Ag antagonist would have been suppressing the LH. And when we give when we are giving antagonist, we can give an agonist to uh, cause a uh, LH such okay only in antagonist cycles we would be able to use a agonist trigger and this completely reduces the risk of OHSS this almost takes away the risk of OHSS okay so let me come to the trigger we know HCG can be given as a trigger because of the um, uh, similarity and agonist trigger is basically uh, the um, uh, tryptorelin, all those uh, luprolin, they can be given as a trigger. Okay, so in this, when we give an agonist trigger in an antagonist cycle, okay, that causes zero HSS because there is no HCG, there is it's almost always. Uh, OHSS does not happen. And in case of HCG, okay, this causes a release of the vasoactive substances, which increases the women to have OHSS. There is something called a dual trigger where both HCG and agonist are used and GnRH agonist with a small dose of HCG can be given, but generally dual, dual triggers are not recommended for a predicted normal responders. Only women who have got um, Poor responders may um, uh, be uh, uh, this dual trigger can be of useful in case when we expect OHSS never give a dual trigger which will include a HCG. Okay, so recombinant HCG and which one should we prefer? We can prefer uh, HCG or a recombinant HCG, but remember recombinant HCG has a batch to batch consistency. And so recombinant HCG or urinary HCG can be recommended, equally recommended. When we give, how much should be the dose? The lower dose is always uh, recommended, probably 5,000. It's preferred over 10,000 international units. And recombinant LH surge, LH should not be given for a trigger because it is got a sharp half-life the stimulation for the ovarian oh, which has, uh, um, for, uh, sorry the stimulation for the LH uh, uh, surge is not given by the recombinant LH so we need a large quantities of LH which would be too um, expensive so recombinant LH is probably not recommended for a trigger so this finishes off with the trigger. So when we give a trigger, then it should be followed by a oocyte and the sperm retrieval. Okay. Generally, oocyte or the sperms, we will come to the sperm separately. When it comes to the oocyte retrieval, ovum pickup or a oocyte retrieval, uh, it is always an ultrasound guided. If you see it on this picture, it's always an ultrasound guided where we put in an ultrasound guide and a needle um, uh, needle through, a needle guide would be attached to this ultrasound guide, TVS probe, and a needle is passed through the pouch of Douglas and the ovaries are, the oocytes are picked up from the stimulated ovaries from both the sides, okay? So it should be your transvaginal ultrasound guided approach and this is the gold standard technique okay and coming to the sperm generally semen is obtained for art either masturbation without any use of any uh, lubricants okay two to five, with a two to five days abstinence or if it is uh, if there is if they are not able to produce it um, by masturbation then either a pizza or a mesa can be used and um, or uh, in case of microscope or if it is a non-obstructive, let me come to that. In case of azospermia, we can uh, retrieve it from the testis. Okay. So what are the sperm retrieval techniques? Sperm retrieval techniques can be, uh, it can be in case of obstructive, okay, it is easy to aspirate. In such cases, we use a percutaneous epididymal sperm aspiration or in case of um, uh, micro uh, surgical epididymal, sperm aspiration 
can be uh, sperm uh, aspiration can be done in case of obstructive um, azospermia. Okay, testicular um, uh, aspiration or uh, uh, in case of uh, non-obstructive, normally we cannot aspirate. In such cases, we will have to do a uh, T cell, which is extraction. Okay, a testicular um, uh, sperm extraction, or it could be a microsurgical testicular extraction. So these two would be um, useful in case of obstructive or non-obstructive uh, causes. Non-obstructive is uh, in case of non-obstructive, we will be able to only extract, whereas in case of obstructive azospermia, we can aspirate. Okay, hope it is uh, clear so far. And so these are the methods by which we uh, uh, get the sperms and then uh, do an ICSI. Okay, ICSI or an IVF, IVF uh, or for all surgically retrieved sperms, it is always good to go ahead with the uh, intracytoplasmic sperm injection. But if there is a normal sperm, uh, normal sperm uh, amount, then we can go ahead with an IVF. And what is the standard method? It's an IVF where we do, this is the uh, four to six hours after oocyte retrieval, which involves incubation of 25,000 to 50,000 capacitated sperms with a single oocyte. And coming to the oocytes, uh, the oocytes are examined after after the standard method. Once this is done, uh, in case of IVF, what we do is uh, we uh, examine about 17 hours later for a pre-zygote, that is two pronuclear and a two polar body activity. Okay, this is how it looks. So uh, with this uh, standard method of IVF, the oocytes are examined after 17 hours for a uh, for the um, two pronuclei, whether it is seen for uh, to identify fertilization. Okay, in case of um, ICSI, once ICSI is done, uh, what we do is we inject a morphologically normal and motile sperm in directly into the oplasm. Okay, this would uh, again this doesn't mean every every uh, even if the um, male oocyte is uh, uh, the male sperm is put into the uh, oocyte, it doesn't confirm fertilization. For that, confirmation of the fertilization is usually done. So this is the way by which uh, in the oocyte is held with a holding paper and then with a, uh, uh, with a uh, 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 needle, we inject the sperm and put the sperm into the oplasm. Okay. And generally, when do we do ICSI for a severe male factor infertility or a surgically retrieved sperm for azospermia, previously failed fertilization, or when the when we have a cryopreserved oocyte and we are doing in uh, fertilization, then we are doing um, uh, the procedure, then we'll have to think of ICSI rather than an IVF. Okay. So generally, the uh, uh, following the day of uh, um, either the uh, ICSI, we look for the fertilization. What do we look? We look for the two pronuclei, okay, and two polar bodies, which is shown here, okay. okay usually the two polar bodies are seen and two, um, sorry, two polar bodies are seen and two pronuclei are seen, which means that the oocyte has been fertilized by the sperm. Okay, so once the sperm uh, has few fer fertilized the oocyte, we look for the the, mm, the embryo grows and we'll have to look at the embryos. Okay, so we leave the embryos for it to multiply and then either we do a day three transfer or a day five transfer. But how do we evaluate the embryos? Embryos, the good embryos are supposed to be placed inside the top quality embryos are supposed to be placed inside the uterine cavity for which we will have to grade the embryos. The morphological evaluation is done with a light microscope and cleavage stages when it is two cell, four cell, eight cell, we call it as a cleavage stage embryos and based on the number of blastomeres. If you see these are the blastomeres, we look at the number and whether they are equal in um, uh, equal in size and fragmentation. If you see this is a good embryo. Okay, where they are equally here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and one will be there. eight cell embryo. Okay, usually this is an eight cell embryo. And uh, here, if you see here, only two, three are in a good uh, size. The others are little unequal. 
and we have fragmentation of the um, embryos also. Okay, so when we look at the blasto, see so this is the cleavage stage embryo, and when it comes to the blastocyst, uh, we again grade the blastocyst depending upon the expansion of the blastocyst okay this is the trophectoderm cells which are you know normal and this is the inner cell mass the inner cell mass in this is very good whereas here there are it is fragmented and this is not a good embryo uh, good blast but this is a good blast okay so this is just to tell you uh, the best quality embryos are usually replaced and um, generally for uh, routine um, uh, transfer we need not do a assisted laser hatching but in case of uh, the routine assisted hatching is not recommended okay in case of failures or a thick zona in such cases laser assisted hatching may be done but otherwise routinely it is not done so once we have done a pickup we need to give the um, endometrium and luteal phase support so what is a luteal phase support the luteal phase support is generally progesterone okay progesterone is recommended for the luteal phase support whether it is an after ivf or ICSI, we need to give the woman a progesterone support so any of the previously mentioned that is a uh, uh, um, usually we can give non oral uh, support also okay so the doses of the natural progesterone usually what should be the dose is 50 milligram once a day uh, intramuscular or if it is a uh, uh, subcutaneous pre preparations okay aqueous preparations then 25 milligram once daily subcutaneous progesterone can be given or if it is a gel okay it is 90 milligram once daily for vaginal progesterones and if it is a micronized vaginal progesterone in oil capsules it should be 200 milligram three times per day okay so um what we we have to do is uh, the recommendation uh, this is for the natural progesterone when it comes to synthetic progesterones like that of a diprogesterone diprogesterone is probably recommended for luteal phase support but there has been enough evidence uh, that progesterone should be used for um, the luteal phase support how much do we give the as I said, 100 milligram, two to three times daily. If it is micronized vaginal progesterone in starch, starch, starch supposed trees, or if it is 400 milligram pessary, then it is two times daily we should be giving. Okay. When do we start? It should be started in the window period between the day of the, um, on the day of the oocyte pickup. Okay. On the evening. Okay, when we are doing it in the morning, on the day of OPU, we'll have to start the progesterone or, and um, we'll have to continue this and day three post oocyte retrieval, we should be uh, continuing on day three, we might transfer the oocytes. Okay, uh, usually progesterone is supplemented until the day of the pregnancy test. It should be continued until the day of the pregnancy test. And once the pregnancy is confirmed, maybe we may have to uh, continue until the placenta takes over. Okay, uh, so what are all the other uh, luteal phase supports? Can we give routine E2, uh, routine estradiol or routine HCG as a luteal phase support? Generally, they are not recommended as a luteal phase support. So how do we do an embryo transfer? It is either done on day three or day, um, uh, day, uh, day two or day three of oocyte re retrieval if you are doing a cleavage stage transfer or if it is day five or day six it is a blastocyst stage in the blastocyst stage if we transfer we do it either on day five or day six usually embryos naturally have a better implantation potential as a result of self-selection they have got a better um, pregnancy rates with day five one or day six embryo transfer if it is done then we do always if it is a top quality we always do a single embryo transfer and the endometrial transfer should be more than five mm generally if it is less than five mm uh, it is preferable not to transfer during that cycle. Okay. And uh, how do we do uh, embryo transfer? It is usually done under a ultrasound guidance and it is done in a partially filled bladder and uh, with an ET catheter. Uh, it is either a soft or a rigid catheters. Usually soft catheters are generally um, used. And um, uh, if we can see that this is the embryo that has been put inside, which is 
the nothing but usually the embryos are placed within the air bubbles and uh, that is why it is very clearly seen and here the embryos are transferred 1.2 to 1.5 centimeters from the um, fundal from the fundus okay in the uterine cavity and um, once the embryo transfer is done uh, it is supported and pregnancy of the luteal phase is supported but then there are strategies how much how many embryos to be put in for so women uh, under the age of 37 in the first full cycle irrespective of the embryo quality we do a single embryo transfer if the age is less okay always do a single embryo transfer whether it's a um, uh, the first would be a single embryo transfer Okay, for the second cycle, if the um, quality of the embryo is good, then we again for the second cycle, we use single embryo transfer. But if there are no top quality embryos, then we do a two embryo transfer. And if it is a third cycle, okay, always uh, we, uh, it, uh, no more than two embryos. Okay, we can do a do, two embryo transfer, double embryo transfer, but generally beyond two embryos, it is not suggested. For women between 37 and 39 years, in the first and the second cycle, if there is a top quality embryo, we do a single embryo transfer. But if there is no top quality embryos, we do a double embryo transfer. And in the third cycle, always it is two embryos. Okay, no more than two embryos should be put in. Whereas in case of women who is beyond 39, that is 40 to 42 years, it's always a double embryo. Two embryos are generally put inside the cavity. Okay, so this is a strategy that is generally followed. And when do we do a basically the idea of doing an ART is to have a pregnancy. So when do we see? We have put on an, uh, embryos which are in either day 3 or day 5 and we support the endometrium with the uh, progesterones and finally we do a pregnancy test either it is urinary or serum bed HCG around 2 weeks following the ovum pickup. Okay, And early pregnancy scan is usually done at 7 weeks of gestation. So this would complete the assisted reproductive techniques and um, uh, and um, the, uh, whatever has been covered and this is basically the assisted reproductive technology with the ovarian, uh, ovarian stimulation protocols. I hope you all enjoyed this uh, video and please like and subscribe so that you would be able to get in more of a, um, uh, early access to all the videos which come up in future. Okay. Thank you all and bye-bye.